Today I want to speak to you on the subject of what does from the river to the sea mean. Many of you have seen this and heard this in recent days. It just seems to be continually on our news and on social media since Benjamin Netanyahu declared war in Israel. Those who are anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian and so forth, uh, you'll hear this chant and you've seen the, uh, the banners and the college campuses and so on and so forth. And the war cry often goes like this, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. What a lot of people do not understand is that this is in many ways connected to Bible prophecy. And in our Bible study today, I want to break this apart as I often do in bite-sized pieces because I believe as a student of the scripture, it's important for you to understand exactly what is being said. And so in our Bible study today, what does from the river to the sea mean? And let's begin all the way back in the first book of the Bible in the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 17, beginning to read at verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. Can I pause right there and ask you a sincere question? Are you serving God faithfully and are you living a blameless life? Some of you perhaps that have found us for the first time or are new students to our channel, I want to say this from the bottom of my heart. There is nothing more important to me than helping you to understand that this channel is not about religiosity. This channel is not about denominationalism. Whether you're Protestant or Catholic or atheist or agnostic or have no real attachment to any philosophy whatsoever. You're important to me. And before I'm done today, I'm going to do what I do in every single broadcast. I will offer you an opportunity. I'd like to have the privilege at the close of our time together of praying with you. There is nothing more important in all of the world in the day and hour in which we're living than knowing that you have peace with God. And I will carefully explain that to you before this day is done. Let's go back into our text. In verse 2, the Bible said, I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down on the ground. Pause again. You perhaps might better know Abram by the name of Abraham. He had a name change a little later in life, but here he is still going by his birth name of Abram. And then God said to him, This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham. For you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. Now, I always ask you when you study the Bible with us to bring a Bible, bring a way of taking notes, and bring a highlighter. I'm going to ask you to run your highlighter through verses 7 and 8. These are critically important to our study today. Verse 7, I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give you the entire land of Canaan, where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever, and I will be their God. 
as we always do, let's just take a moment to pray together. Father, we never open up the sacred scriptures uh, without the awareness uh, that you're holy and the Bible is sacred and we are in desperate need of your grace and your mercy in all that we do. And so today I humble my heart in your holy presence and before this audience and I pray that by the wisdom and the counsel and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you'll lead us and guide us into all truth. I pray specifically for those who may be listening, who down deep in their heart, perhaps are not sure as to where they stand with God. May they clearly understand today that there is no sin in their life, there is nothing in their past greater than your forgiveness, greater than your grace and mercy, and we praise you for the promise and the integrity of the Bible that declares all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let today be the hour of decision for hundreds and thousands of people, we pray. And for all things, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory, for we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Uh, there is probably no greater conflict over land rights in history than the conflict that goes on in Israel, both historically and even as I speak. Uh, for in this very moment as I am sharing with you, one of the great conflicts in Israel's history one of the most violent is currently on display for the eyes of the entire world to behold. And make no mistake about the seriousness of this conflict because it is clearly prophesied in the Bible as an end time sign and a warning that we are living in the final moments of church history that will soon end with an event that is oftentimes referred to as the rapture of the church. You are living prophetically between Daniel's 69th week and Daniel's 70th week. If you're a new student to the Bible, Daniel is one of the major Old Testament prophets, and David had, or excuse me, Daniel had an incredible vision called the vision of the 70 weeks. I have teaching on that if you'd like to listen to it, and I trust that at some time you will. But all 69 sets of seven, and those were seven years, all 69 sets of seven years that Daniel wrote and saw in that vision have already come to pass with complete and total accuracy. And there is only one set of seven yet to be fulfilled. And that final and 70th set of seven years is a period of time called the Great Tribulation. I also have videos and teaching and podcasts on the Tribulation period. But we are currently in a time slot often referred to in eschatology as the prophetic pause, a pause between the 69th set of seven and the 70th set of seven, which is the tribulation period of exactly seven years, and that prophetic pause is oftentimes called in theology the church age. That was mentioned and prophesied by Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. He said to his disciples, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What is the church age? Well, it began with the first advent of Christ. It will conclude with the second advent of Christ. But it was a prophetic pause whereby the grace of God was made available to the Gentiles. Why? Romans 11 tells us specifically why. God opened his arms of grace and made salvation available to the Gentiles to make the Jews who had rejected the Messiah, Christ, jealous. 
I'm not going to get into the layers of that today, but I want you to understand as we walk through this study that you are living in the church age. And the next major prophetic event is a signless event in Bible prophecy called the rapture. The accelerated increase of anti-Semitism, this hatred for Israel and for the Jews, is actually prophesied in the scripture. And the Bible tells us that as we approach the end of the age, that it's going to escalate into a series of bloody wars that will culminate in Israel in a geographical place called the Valley of Megiddo. And there will be a battle that the book of Revelation calls the Battle of Armageddon. And so in the very infancy of our Bible study today, I want you to see that there is a connection between growing hatred for the existence of Israel and for the Jewish people and for anti-Semitism that seems to be like a bonfire in our world, in our cities, on our college and university campuses. And I am telling you, not from my opinion, but from the authority of the Bible, this accelerated hatred for Israel and for the Jews is a major prophetic sign of the time that we're living in, and you need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. If you're taking notes, question number one, what does from the river to the sea mean? Because many of you will know what it means, but many will not know what it means. From the river to the sea is a popular rallying war cry for anti-Semitic terrorist groups as well as all of their sympathizers. It is often shouted in protests, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. It is the war cry of the popular front for the liberation of Palestine, oftentimes referred to as PFLP. It is the war cry of Hamas and the Taliban and almost every terrorist group calling for Israel's destruction and for the annihilation of Jews worldwide. From the river to the sea is actually in the original chartered documents of Hamas that were drafted in 1988. From the river to the sea has become a call to arms for pro-Palestinian activists, including student activists on campuses all over the world. Approximately 30 miles or so, maybe 31, 32, 33 miles south of the Bible college that I serve as president, North Point Bible College and Seminary, is one of the most famous colleges in the world, and that's Harvard University. And Harvard, sadly, has been providing support for pro-Palestinian protests, and thousands of Harvard students are carrying out anti-Israel protests, shouting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Not only carrying the banners and shouting the war cries and the hatred and spewing their bias, they are actually wearing headbands that whether they realize it or not are the headbands of terrorists and the headbands in particular of Hamas. And it's so sad to see this here in the United States of America as well as many countries of the world where some of you may be watching. Massive crowds are protesting in American cities, openly spewing their hatred of Israel and chanting their support of their terrorist enemies. But now we understand from the river to the sea that it is actually a part of a terrorist charter. It is in the charter of Hamas in particular, drafted in 1988, but let me help you to understand it a little better. When they say from the river to the sea, number two, what river and what sea? In other words, what is the specific geography behind from the river to the sea? 
the river refers to the Jordan River. And I have a map and a visual that I'm going to leave on the screen for several seconds because I want you to see that the Jordan River, which rises on the slopes of Mount Hermon, on the border between Syria and Lebanon, and it flows southward through northern Israel to the Sea of Galilee, oftentimes referred to as Lake Tiberias. The Jordan River, by the way, is the lowest flowing river in the world. And it's more than 223 miles or 360 kilometers in length. But because, as is the tr truth for almost all rivers around the world, it meanders, the actual distance between its source and the Dead Sea is about 124 miles or approximately 200 kilometers. It exits the Sea of Galilee and continues south, dividing Israel and the Israeli-occupied West Bank to the west from Jordan to the east before emptying into the Dead Sea, which is also the lowest place on the face of this earth. And so the Jordan River is the lowest river on the face of the earth, and the Dead Sea to which it flows is the actual lowest land point on earth. After 1948, the Jordan River actually became the marker for the frontier between Israel and Jordan from just south of the Sea of Galilee. But since 1967, in the War of 1967, when Israeli forces occupied the West Bank, the Jordan River has served as the ceasefire line. It's oftentimes in news uh, referred to as the ceasefire line as far south as the Dead Sea. And so from the river to the sea, the river is speaking of the Jordan River, and the sea is referring to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the geography of Israel, and I've had the privilege of being there on three occasions, is very diverse. It has desert conditions in the south, but it also has snow-capped mountains in the north. And Israel is located on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. It is bounded to the north by Lebanon, uh, to the northeast by Syria, uh, to the east by Jordan and the West Bank, and to the southwest by Egypt. To the west of Israel is the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, that makes up the majority of Israel's 170 mile or 273 kilometer coastline and the Gaza Strip. Israel also has a small coastline on the Red Sea in the northern region. Thirdly and lastly, I want you to understand that God has established Israel's borders as an everlasting covenant. The landmass we call Israel is currently not the landmass promised by God. I'll explain that in a little greater detail. But if you're taking notes, number three, God established Israel's border as an everlasting covenant. Now, there are a multitude of scriptures and passages in the Old Testament, beginning in Genesis and going throughout that describe the borders. Uh, perhaps at a later date, I will do a Bible study that deals specifically with the biblical passages that outline God's covenant in detail concerning the promised land given to them. But according to Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, and also in the book of Joshua and the first chapter, beginning at verse 1 and reading through verse 4, modern-day Israel does not yet, very important, does not yet occupy the land that God has promised to them. Uh, let's take a quick moment, open your Bible with me into uh, the book of Joshua 
And go to chapter 1 with me. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1. And perhaps highlight the first four verses as I read them to you or as you read along. Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said... Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised to Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south, to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. So here is a passage that gives us the promised land. You've heard that phrase before, or the holy land. And I want it to be clear again. Let me repeat it. I don't want you to miss this. The land that we currently see in our modern age as Israel, a small portion of land, actually smaller if you live here in the United States, smaller than the state of Connecticut. It is not a large landmass that they currently occupy, but the landmass that they currently occupy does not represent the totality of the land, the promised land, that was promised to them from God. The land that God gave to Israel included everything, listen carefully, from the Nile River in Egypt to Lebanon, south and north, and everything from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates River, west to east. On today's map, the land God has stated belongs to Israel, includes everything modern-day Israel already possesses, but it includes much more because it includes all of the territory occupied by the Palestinians, the West Bank, and Gaza. It also includes part of Egypt and Syria, all of Jordan, some of Saudi Arabia, and even Iraq. Now, I don't know if you were paying attention to that geographical definition, but I want you to remember this because it's one of the most important things that you can learn in this Bible study, is that the land of Israel that we now know of by its modern borders is only a portion of the landmass that God has promised to them. Thus, Israel currently possesses a fraction of the land in the covenant that God made with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, uh, name change to Israel, Moses, Joshua, etc. The land covenant of God, which is guaranteed and is irrevocable and eternal, according to my understanding of Bible prophecy, The remaining part of the land covenant will not be brought back to them or given to them until the return of the Messiah, which is Jesus Christ. And most scholars believe that this total landmass that I described and read to you out of Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, most scholars believe this will not be completely fulfilled until the millennial reign of Christ. So I want to conclude by making a couple of incredibly valuable points. Number one, the people who occupy what some people refer to as Palestine, what some people describe in the news, they'll focus in as they have recently, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and so on. Not, listen, not everybody who lives there, are you listening? 
not everybody who lives there is a terrorist. Those land masses that sadly are occupied by terrorists, and in particular Hamas, are causing a lot of the major conflict and bloodshed that goes on even as I speak. Sadly, the terrorist group Hamas has set themselves up in bunkers most of the time built under hospitals, built under schools, built under the residence of innocent people and innocent children, and the tragedy that has come out of that is indescribable. I want to be abundantly clear, please don't miss this. Not everyone who occupies that part of the world is a terrorist. And the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for all. I've often preached through the years Never call those your enemies whom God has called the harvest. And so I don't want this teaching to be lopsided in stating that the only people we preach about or teach about or share from prophecy is Israel at the expense of neglecting the souls of innocents that live in surrounding nations. Now, let's also be honest in telling you that the majority of all of the nations that surround Israel are Muslim and they openly declare their hatred for Israel and for the Jews. That is fact. But we must never forget that in those nations there are innocent people and there are people who do not hate the Jews. Now they would be the minority. I am in no wise living with my head in the sand. I repeat, when you look at a map and see the tiny nation of Israel, you will see that she is surrounded throughout that region of the world with Islamic nations that are conducting holy jihad and by and large want the elimination of the nation of Israel and the extermination of every Jew on the face of the earth. But I repeat, there are innocent people in that region of the world, and sadly in the war that continues as I speak has brought bloodshed and horror and rape and burning and beheading and things unspeakable, the majority of which lies at the feet of a terrorist organization called Hamas. And Israel has every right to protect her land. Israel has every right to destroy her enemies. Israel has every right to aggressively go after terrorists that are bent on their annihilation. But I will also allow in grace that I'm sure that many of the people who are marching here in the United States, on our colleges, on our university campus, marching against Israel and being pro-Palestinian and chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. In grace, I'll allow that some of these people in sheer ignorance may be repeating these things, not knowing the real history of this hatred for Israel and the Jewish people that they support. I watched one large group of hundreds of people on one of our uh, Ivy League schools here in the United States led by an LGBTQ plus group. And I wondered as, as those who were parts of this LGBTQ group uh, wrapped with headbands of terrorism and Hamas and carrying these banners and spewing and swearing and you know, it's almost like venom that comes out of them in a demonic way, their hatred for Israel, the annihilation of the Jews. I wondered if they knew that the people that they are representing, if they were in those nations, they would be beheaded. They would be quickly hung. There is absolutely no allowance in the Islamic world 
for homosexuality, for lesbianism, and for gender fluidity. They would immediately be tortured and beheaded and burned alive and hung. And there they protest, perhaps not even having an idea that the people they're supporting, if given an opportunity, would quickly annihilate them as quickly as they would the Jews. But in closing, let me abundantly make this clear. Listen carefully. The expression from the river to the sea. We've explained to you that the river is the Jordan River, the eastern boundary of Israel, to the sea, which is the Mediterranean Sea, which is the western boundary of Israel. From the river to the sea is a war cry of Hamas and terrorists around the world that is in, let's be clear, it means they want the total eradication of the statehood of Israel and they are praying to Allah for the day when every Jew on the face of the earth will be annihilated. It is a war cry. It is a cry of jihad. It is a cry of unspeakable horror and hatred. It is impossible, hear me carefully, it is impossible to be a Christian and hate Israel. It is impossible to be a Christian, according to the Bible, not according to me, and hate the Jewish people. It is impossible possible to be a Christian and to cry out the words from the river to the sea. And so today I've provided this Bible study to you because I want to, in grace, but in absolute factuality, explain to you what this cry that's being heard in the city streets, in colleges, in campuses, in universities, and across the news and social media, what does it mean? From the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free is calling for the eradication of the statehood of Israel and the total annihilation of every single Jew. Are you aware of the fact that the Bible says all who curse Israel will be cursed? That's why it's impossible to be a Christian and embrace anti-Semitism. Let me close by reading to you out of the book of Genesis in the 12th chapter. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your family's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. Listen to verse 3. Run your highlighter through it. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Has anyone ever loved you enough to open the Bible and teach you the weight those who curse Israel will be cursed, and those who bless Israel shall be blessed. It is impossible to be a Christian and embrace the war cry from the river to the sea. To do so is to bring yourself under the curse and the judgment of God. And in closing, I want to be abundantly clear about one more thing. If you're listening to me right now, you are either living under the blessing of God or you are living under the curse of God. You might ask, Tiff, how do I know which I'm living under? Well, the Bible's very clear on this as well. The Bible tells us that we were all born with the curse of sin, all of us. The Bible says in the third chapter of Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one person, including me, who could raise a hand and say, I have never sinned. All have sinned. And James 1.15 says, sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. 
The curse of sin is death, and the curse of sin rests and abides upon all who have not repented of sin and trusted in the grace and the forgiveness that's available through God and through His Son, Jesus Christ. The most memorized verse in the Bible, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. That word perish means face judgment for the curse of sin. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. Today, you can do what I've seen hundreds of people do in my travels in recent days. As I've given the invitation in our Lost Lamb events for people to personally and publicly admit their sin, believe in Jesus Christ, and in childlike faith, make a commitment to Him. You can do that right now. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me what many people call a sinner's prayer. And when we're done praying, if you've prayed that prayer and you're sincere, I want you to go into the comments and just write something from your heart, perhaps saying something like, Tiff, I want you to know that I prayed that prayer with you, and today I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And then I want you to click on our playlist on our YouTube channel. It's entitled, New Beginnings. And when you get a chance in the days ahead, I want you to begin to listen to the teachings that I have provided specifically for you. Because when you repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ, that is not the end of what God's going to do with you. It's just the beginning. Just like a brand new baby born into the world, you need to grow and be nurtured in your faith and that's why we've prepared that playlist entitled New Beginnings, and it's all free, no charge whatsoever. We care about you and want to help you. And so when you're done praying, will you write a comment in the comment section letting me know you prayed? And then I want you to begin to, as you're able, study each and every one of those Bible studies available on our New Beginnings list. Whether you're praying with me for the first time or you've been away from God and you're coming home, maybe you've been guilty of chanting some political rhetoric that you really had no idea as to the curse of what you had embraced with the fruit of your lips and today you want to turn from that and turn to God and trust in His mercy. Wherever you might be, just pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, Today, as I was listening to the Bible, I believe you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. And so today, I confess my sin. And I trust in the cross and in your only begotten Son, Jesus, who died, was buried, and rose again, and promised in the Bible that he would return. Today I receive salvation in childlike faith. I turn from sin. I turn to God. And I ask you to cleanse me with the blood that was shed on the cross. Cleanse my mind and my body and my spirit. Today I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And I'll never be the same. Today, I am no longer the property of sin. Today, I become a child of God. The curse of sin is broken, and the blessing of God is now mine. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. We're going to do an important Bible study today on the subject of what does the Bible say about my unsaved spouse. There are many people, uh, sadly, a growing number of people, who find themselves in marriages where one spouse is a Christian and the other spouse is not. Sometimes the husband is a Christian and the wife is not. Sometimes the wife is a Christian and the husband is not. 
Sometimes there are marriages where they entered into, or perhaps in your case, you entered into marriage, and neither of you were Christians. But in the course of your marriage, one of the spouses came to faith. And then there are those who get married. I think of friends of mine that come to my mind that they were married as Christians, and currently one of the spouses is not living a Christian life, and it causes major conflict. And so that will be the subject of our Bible study today because the Bible actually has very detailed counsel for just such a difficult union. And we're going to be reading today out of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you have your Bible. And we're going to be answering three questions uh, in our Bible study today. Number one, what does it mean to be unequally yoked? Because the Bible writes to us in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul about the dangers of being unequally yoked. From the original language, what does that really mean? Question number two, is it all right if I divorce or leave my unsaved spouse? Have things become so difficult? Has the suffering reached such a level that it's unbearable and you're now beginning to wonder, does God allow me the potential of divorcing an unsaved spouse? And then question number three, for those who perhaps would say, well, uh, it's difficult, but I want my marriage to survive, the third question I'm going to answer in our Bible study today is how can I find strength to remain? Or what does the Bible require of me so that I can stay in an unequally yoked marriage? So those three questions will be plenty uh, for our Bible study today. As always, if you're one of our new students around the world, we welcome you. So glad to have you a part of one of the largest online Bible studies uh, available. Almost a million, sometimes more students per month. Always have a Bible, have a way of taking notes, and I encourage you to get a highlighter so that you can mark up some of these classic and practical passages of Scripture so that you can study on your own as well and refer back to them and find great strength that comes only from the Word of God. And so let's read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and go down to verse 11. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul, the author of the letters to the Corinthian church. He writes two and this is his second letter, and in the sixth chapter and the eleventh verse, let's pick up there, reading out of the New Living Translation. O oh, dear Christian friends, or Corinthian friends, and I want it to be clear that he's not writing to unbelievers. This is a church. He's speaking to Christians at Corinth. O oh, dear Corinthian friends, we have spoken honestly with you, and our hearts are open to you. There is no lack of love on our part, but you have withheld your love from us. I am asking you to respond as if you were my own children. Open your hearts to us. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. I like how the King James uses the illustration don't be unequally yoked together. We'll come back to that. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and will walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves 
from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you, and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. As always, when we do these Bible studies, we start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, finish in the Bible. But before we get started, we always like to take a moment to pray with you and to pray for you. And I'd like to do that right now. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you, first of all, uh, for there are so many in the world that do not even have a copy of the Bible. Thank you that we have the Bible written in our language to read and to study and to digest. And we thank you for the promise of the scriptures that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It gives us clear direction and shows us how to proceed even in tough and dark and difficult times. I pray for every listener today and especially those who are battling the very essence of this question on being in an unequally yoked marriage. I pray that the counsel of God today would strengthen us and if necessary, correct us. And we pray, Father, most of all, that every single listener would live every day ready to meet the Lord. And we ask now for the Holy Spirit to be the great teacher Lead us into truth in these moments, we pray, for it is in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord that we say yes and amen, and all God's people said amen. Uh, in this Bible study, it's very important, as always, to pay attention uh, to the context of the passage, because if you were paying attention to the passage, I've heard many people preach on this passage as if it were solely dedicated to marriage. And quite frankly, it is not. As a matter of fact, nowhere in that passage, at least in the English translation, do we even find the word marriage. So this passage is not specifically and exclusively talking about dating and marriage as many times people who preach and teach from this passage run off in that direction. Again, always important that we read and understand the scriptures within context. And so Paul is not specifically talking about dating and marriage. In this passage, Paul is speaking about the fatal flaw of all relationships that involve a partnering of believer and non-believer. So it is not a violation of biblical hermeneutics, which is simply the proper interpretation of biblical passages. It is not a violation hermeneutically to refer to this passage and speak about marriage, but I do want to help you to understand that this passage is not dedicated to marriage or to dating. It is in context referring to all unequally yoked relationships in this world. And what it does do is it condemns the partnering of believers and unbelievers. This goes far beyond dating and marriage. Because being unequally yoked with unbelievers not only affects marriages, not only has impacts on people involved in serious relationships or dating or just getting engaged, it also affects family relationships. It affects business endeavors. It affects work environments and so on and so forth. And this is not a New Testament precept it is an Old Testament precept as well, because the psalmist wrote, it said, blessed are those who walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. So let me lay that down as a foundational truth as we proceed. There is always the fatal flaw that exists when a believer and an unbeliever are yoked together. 
whether it be in dating, whether it be in marriage, whether it be in family, whether it be in business, whether it be in the workplace, so on and so forth. The Bible goes on to say, what fellowship can righteousness have with unrighteousness? And what fellowship can there be between the devil and the Lord Jesus Christ? So if you're taking notes, be sure that you write down, there is an inherent fatal flaw in all relationships where you're dealing with one who is a follower of Christ and another who is not a follower of Christ, or in biblical terminology, a believer and an unbeliever. And the Bible's clear. Uh, you cannot escape this. There is no wiggle room in this. Paul simply tells us Christians should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Uh, not long ago, uh, Lost Lamb partners, friends of mine, a uh, young couple, and they were wanting to start their own business. And they had a business opportunity that was an incredible opportunity with great financial potential. And they sought my counsel as my dear friends. And when I found out that the individual who was offering them this incredible business opportunity was not a Christian, I said, you cannot put the potential of financial gain ahead of what the scripture says. My counsel to you, I'll give it to you as a father would give to his own children. I don't care what the financial opportunity is. If I'm going to go into business, I am not going to go into business with an unbeliever because things may start well, but there is an inherent fatal flaw. You will eventually bang heads in that business and there's no amount of money that's worth your family and your peace and your future. So let's not forget the context of this passage. There is always a fatal flaw that cannot be removed. You can't counsel it away in marriage sessions. If a believer is married to an unbeliever, there will be problems. Let's get right into our three questions. If you're taking notes, question number one, what does it mean to be unequally yoked together? And as I mentioned to you, I like the King James uh, verbiage here, unequally yoked together. And the reason why I like this is because it's particularly descriptive. Now, if you do not know what a yoke is, we're not talking about an egg yoke, Y-O-L-K. We're talking about a piece of old farm equipment, Y-O-K-E. And it basically was a brace that allowed two animals to be joined together at the neck, and then plows were typically hooked to it, and there were other uh, pieces of of primitive farm equipment that were used, but two animals were yoked together, neck to neck, tightly and closely together, and they were sent off to work. So imagine this, because in your mind, if you can imagine, let's just say, two uh, bulls, uh, two oxen, pick your favorite two animals, they were typically uh, beasts of burden, mules, etc. But when they were yoked together, they had to move as one. If one moved forward, the other had to move forward. You no longer had the autonomy of one animal deciding to work and move forward and the other deciding to take a 10 minute break. Both had to move together, both had to turn left together, both had to turn right together, both had to stop together, both had to have meals together, both had to drink from the water source together, etc., etc. And the Bible gives us this visual of being yoked together, and it applies to marriage, just as it applies to business 
and family and so on. But it's a great descriptor when we think of marriage because in marriage you willingly forfeit your autonomy. You are not only pledging love, you are pledging life and you are pledging goals and you are pledging purpose and you are pledging agreement. The husband and the wife, the Bible tells us, become one. You are yoked together. And so even in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 10, the Bible says, you shall not plow an ox and a donkey together. Well, why not? They're both beasts of burden. They're both farm animals. They're both perfectly capable of being harnessed and yoked. Well, the reason is, is the ox is much bigger. The ox, in many cases, will be taller. And it puts an incredible strain upon the donkey to be yoked together with an ox. And it's unique that it made it in to the law of God for agriculture and for farming that simple common sense. But common sense, unfortunately, is not always common. And sadly, many marriages have an ox and a donkey yoked together. And there's 100 punchlines in that. And I'll avoid all 100 of them to stay in the scriptures because some of you are wondering, am I the ox or am I the ass? Well, again, we're going to bypass all of that and stay in the Bible so we stay out of trouble. But imagine the conflict that would ensue if you hook two different types of farm animals together that are different sizes, different weights, different heights, different strengths, and so on. There is, again a fatal flaw. Are you getting this? Because we're going to come back to this repeatedly. There is a fatal flaw when you have a believer and an unbeliever yoked together. And here's the problem, and I'm going to get myself in trouble here with a lot of people. Uh, do not consider what I'm about to say to be anti-Christian counseling because I'm not against Christian counseling. Uh, as a matter of fact, you are literally listening to Christian counseling as we speak. But here is my problem. Many times, as a matter of fact, I just recently read that the largest growing segment of couples who enter into counseling, and not just Christian counseling, secular marriage counseling, the largest segment are people who are unequally yoked together, believers and unbelievers, or people from different faiths, uh, a Jew who is married a Catholic, a Catholic who's married a Protestant, uh, a Protestant who's married an unbeliever, and again, multiple, multiple options there. But it is the largest segment in modern marriage counseling. Here's my problem. They don't sometimes consider what I have made clear to you on multiple occasions and for reasons why. Because there is a fatal flaw. What is the fatal flaw? A believer yoked with an unbeliever, biblically, is forbidden. It is a fatal flaw with eternal consequence. Because it is a fatal flaw, fatal flaws cannot be counseled away. No amount of marriage counseling is going to solve the fatal flaw. Now, you may work on being peaceable. You may work on trying to keep harmony. You may work on scheduling intimacy when that has become difficult. And all of the things that marriage counselors may offer to you, you may work on those things. And I'm not saying that the relationship cannot be made easier, but don't miss what I'm about to say. Because there is a violation of God's eternal truth, where a believer is yoked together with an unbeliever, are you paying attention? There is always going to be suffering. Thank you for those words of encouragement today, Tiff. 
I'm not trying to discourage you. I am telling you, when you have things that are forbidden in the scripture, you can't counsel that until it is biblical. If it's unbiblical, it's unbiblical. That brings me to the second question. Can I leave my unsaved spouse? That question was sent to me twice last week. If I am involved in a marriage that is unequally yoked, and you know, one lady that wrote to me, her husband was unsaved, had never been saved, and uh, she was a Christian. Well, somebody should have been counseling her before she got married. But sometimes people get married thinking they can fix the other spouse. Or they think, you know, I have this unique ability to train animals and I know that I can make that man become the man I want him to be. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. If you are a believer and you willingly and knowingly marry an unbeliever because you violated and in a willful act of disobedience have betrayed the counsel of God, there will be suffering. There will be conflict. There will be discord. Now, I'm not going to leave you there. My last question I'm going to offer you, the counsel of the scripture on, on how do we uh, deal with such relationships. But I want you to go back to our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to show you a verse that is continuously uh, misinterpreted. I, I've heard notable ministries uh, completely take this out of context, and it needs explanation in this truth. And that is 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Take a look at it. And if you have a highlighter, this is a verse that I'd like for you to highlight. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. And I will welcome you. Many people take that verse, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord as an opportunity to dissolve a complicated relationship. I've heard individuals say, well, that's a Bible verse where God in His infinite grace understands uh, the carnality and the weakness of human frailty, and He gives us this escape clause that if a spouse, a husband, or a wife is not a believer, and you try and you try and you just can't resolve the conflict in your marriage, you need to come out from among them and be separated. This is not, listen, this is not a biblical passage allowing for separation in a marriage. This is not a biblical passage saying if your spouse is unsaved, separate yourselves from them and don't touch that unclean individual anymore. That's not at all what the Bible is saying. This is not permission to leave an unsaved spouse. It is a call to holy living. It is a call to separation from sinful practices. And it is a biblical call to separate from ungodly connections. It is not permission to walk out of your marriage even if your spouse is unsaved. That is not what verse 17 means at all. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians and the 7th chapter. And here's where the Bible starts to get quite detailed. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 17, reading again out of the New Living Translation. Listen very carefully to what the Bible says. But for those who are married... If you're married, I have a command, not negotiable, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. 
So Paul is saying, I have a command. This is non-negotiable, and it's not my writing. It's not my ID. It didn't originate from me, Paul is saying. He said, this comes from the Lord. I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband. That's how we know that come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, is not permission to leave your husband or your wife, as sadly is frequently misinterpreted. And how do we know that? Once again, you can't take a text and read a single text and try to build doctrine out of a single text. You have to read text, and I've taught you this a hundred times. You have to read text within context. You have to read context within the total narrative. And you have to analyze the total narrative by the entire book. And you have to analyze and secure the teachings of doctrine from the entirety of the Bible and not just a book from the Bible. All things in the scripture have to harmonize. So the Bible is saying a wife must not leave her husband. Let's read on. But if she does leave him, but if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to him. And so if the unsaved, in this particular case, it's an unsaved husband and a saved wife, and the wife leaves the unsaved husband. Now, there are reasons, biblical reasons for divorce. Now, God hates divorce because divorce and marriage is a microcosm of your relationship with God. Just as God wants to enter into a lifelong relationship with you and he never wants to divorce you, he never wants you to divorce him. That's why on divorce, the Bible is seemingly and is pretty tough, especially by 21st century morality, which is almost non-existent. But the Bible tells us if she does leave, she must remain single or pray that she becomes reconciled to her husband. And then let's read on. And the husband must not leave his wife. Verse 12, now I will speak to the rest of you, though I do not have a direct command from the Lord. If a fellow believer has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to continue living with him, he must not leave, here, leave her. If a fellow believer has a wife who is not a believer, we're talking about a husband who is a Christian, the wife is not but she is willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. Verse 14, For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage, and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but now they are holy. Verse 15, but if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other, for God has called you to live in peace. And peace should be the backbone of all healthy relationships. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. Many of you don't have progress in your marriages because you're not pursuing peace. You keep digging stuff up, which is not peaceable actions. It's not the intelligent thing to do. Sometimes you have to forget things that are in the past and put them in prayer and never open the box again and make up your mind if you're going to survive a difficult relationship, you had better put peace at the top of the list because human nature, now this is not Christian nature, this is human nature. 
let me give you one of the most important lessons you'll ever learn from human nature. People run from pain. So if your words and your actions and your attitude and your disrespect and your dishonor and your nagging and your belittling and you're never doing anything except bringing conflict to the marriage and causing your spouse to feel pain, people run from pain. But here's the flip side of that golden nugget. People run to pleasure. And so if you'll make an effort to be peaceable and be smart enough to ask the Lord in prayer, Father, show me where I'm bringing discomfort to my marriage. Show me where I'm bringing frustration to my marriage. Show me where I am assassinating peace in my marriage. Show me where I'm not affirming in my marriage. Teach me how to bring pleasure to my marriage. This is one of the secrets to surviving a difficult relationship where one spouse is a believer and the other is an unbeliever. You don't bang the unbeliever over the head with the Bible eight hours a day telling them what a filthy heathen they are. If you're going to have a marriage that's sustainable, you had better figure out how to be the master of peace and pleasure. If you'll bring peace and pleasure into your relationship, that single sacrifice, because in many cases it'll be a sacrifice to be peaceable, because you'll have a thousand questions about things that have gone on, or failures, or, or a cheating spouse, or, or sin, or alcoholism, or on and on and on. And again, there are biblical reasons that allow for divorce. Uh, I'll give you three. One would be adultery. And it's not mandatory. You can survive a marriage where one of the spouses has cheated, either believer or unbeliever. But if one of the spouses has cheated and been sexually unfaithful, you have the liberty to leave that marriage, but you don't necessarily have the liberty to continue on in pursuing one relationship after another. If they want to stay married, even if they've cheated, the Bible has already said, you should be willing if possible. Adultery number one. I have teaching on this, so I'm not going to go into depth. I have other teaching on marriage. If you're brand new to our YouTube channel, you can scan down through the history of our videos that are available, and you'll find that there are several other uh, video teachings and Bible teachings on marriage and various subjects that I, I don't have time to cover today. Adultery one, number two, abuse. If your spouse, female or male, husband or wife, if they are physically abusive, you don't have to stay in that marriage. As a matter of fact, if I found out that my daughter was being abused by her husband, she wouldn't have to leave that marriage. She would only have to attend his funeral because I would never tolerate my daughter's husband treating her that way. But sometimes it's done in secret and people are suffering abuse and they don't let on. They don't tell anybody. They put makeup over bruises and, and make up stories of falling down the steps and so forth. But you don't have to stay in a marriage where you are consistently being physically abused. Adultery releases you from the vow of marriage. Abuse allows you to leave a marriage and abandonment. If your husband or your wife has left you, gone back to the country they were from or moved across country or even moved across town and they have left you and it's been prolonged. I'm not talking about you had a fight and he, he moved into a hotel room for two nights. I'm talking about they have left you, abandoned you. They, they are gone. They, they have no plans on coming back. They're not providing for you. They're not providing for the children, etc. Those are three biblical reasons that give us the ability to dissolve a marriage. Adultery, abuse, and abandonment. But notice that the scripture says, if they're willing to stay together, whether it's the husband or the wife, you need to stay together. Now let's go to verse 16. 
Verse 15, in such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other, for God has called you to live in peace. Verse 16, don't you wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you? And don't you husbands realize that your wives might be saved because of you? Each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God first called you. So again, we get back to the fatal flaw that there is going to be a conflict. There is going to be head-on collisions. There is going to be potential suffering in a relationship where one spouse is a believer and the other spouse is not. But are those hurdles of conflict, is that fatal flaw not overcomable? No, the Bible tells us that you can remain in that marriage, but you're going to have to consider what I told you. People run from pain and people run to pleasure. So if there's a lot of pain in your marriage, somebody's not keeping up with the pleasure. Somebody's not keeping up with the peace. There is never a time in marriage when the intimacy of sexuality should be abandoned. The Bible forbids that. The only time there should be a disillusion is a willing agreement to abstain from sexual relationships for the purpose of fasting, and that's not mandatory. But many people get in a difficult relationship, and for whatever reasons, they no longer are interested in pleasuring the other partner. You have brought the fatal flaw, even if both are saved or both are unsaved, because that is a part of peace and pleasure. They're foundational stones to the marriage, and your marriage will never be what God intended it to be if you are not keeping up with peace and pleasure. Is that too graphic? I hope not, because it's in the Bible. Lastly, and I close with this, how do I remain in an unequally yoked marriage? Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, because uh, the Bible does give us very clear counsel there. And then we'll conclude. 1 Peter and the third chapter, verses 1 through 7. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Pause right there. Many women, even saved women, undermine their marriages because they feel, because they're the Christian, that they have charge of the marriage that they know more than the unsaved husband. Listen, women, and I say this to you in loving counsel, if you're a born-again Christian and your husband is unsaved, the Bible does not permit you to be disrespectful and dishonorable to the authority of your husband in the home. Even if he is unsaved, there must be respect and honor and a recognition of his authority. Now, I'm a man, so I can talk to you about men. Men are not nearly as complicated as women. I told somebody in a conference call today, I said, I've written a book on marriage that will soon be released. It's over 400 pages long, and the title of the book is Everything I Have Learned About Women in My Entire 60 Years of Life. Unfortunately, it's 400 blank pages, but it was easy to write. But I can speak to you as a man, and I can tell you that men are not nearly as complicated as women. Men need love. They need affection. They need intimacy, and they need honor. If you provide your husband with those four things, even if he's unsaved, you can still build a relationship that can go through tough times. But if you're going to just make up your mind, he doesn't follow Christ and I follow Christ, and you have decided to put the flashlight upon the fatal flaw 
instead of how do you remedy those difficult decisions, then you can be guaranteed that the fatal flaw and the suffering will continue. Let's read on. First Peter chapter three, verses one through seven, in the same way you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Let me pause right there. I actually have very dear friends in Texas and they're in ministry. And quite honestly, they got saved after they were married and the husband was in the cartel and his father was in the cartel. It ran in the family. And so when they got married, he being a part of the cartel, his life revolved around drugs and money and all of the other things that go with that. There was never a lack of money in their home. They had unlimited access to money. I mean, they had stacks of it because, you know, it's difficult to laundry. In the world, they call it laundering dirty money, illegal money. But as a young couple, he had access to more money than he could spend. So they always had money. You know what happened? She got saved and she got gloriously saved. When she got saved, she came home and she told her husband, I'm going to get a job. He said, get a job. We have more money than we can spend in a lifetime. What do you mean you're going to get a job? I've already applied. I'm getting a job. I'm going to be a waitress at such and such an establishment. He was mad. You are not going to be a waitress. She didn't give him an option. She said, I have given my heart to Christ and I love you but I cannot in good conscience spend one more dollar of this blood money. People have died. People have overdosed. People have been killed. I will not spend a dollar of your money. And she kept her word. It brought him as a man under such conviction, but she did it with a gentle spirit. And finally with time, he too came to Christ and they left that lifestyle. I can't tell you the full testimony time would not allow. The cartel tried to kill them. They sent people with AK-47s. They got the wrong address. Instead of breaking into their home and killing them and assassinating them in bed, they got the wrong address and broke into the neighbor's house and killed the neighbors with AK-47s. With threat of life, their commitment to Christ was unbending. But how did she win her husband to the Lord? With a gentle spirit, with a quiet spirit. She continued to love, her, love him, to honor him, to maintain the intimacy of their marriage, but she just wouldn't spend another dollar of that blood money. This is what the Bible is talking about. Uh, let's go back to verse 3. Uh, verse 2 said, they will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Verse 3, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That's exactly how she won her husband over to the Lord, as I just shared with you which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. Here's a beauty tip for you. Bet you didn't expect that in the Bible study. God has a supernatural way of making you beautiful. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands for instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Now, it doesn't just stop there. Now it turns the spotlight to the husbands. Verse 7, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, 
but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers, treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. So there we have the biblical answer on how do I deal with a spouse in an unequally yoked marriage. It is survivable, but you must remember there is a fatal flaw. There will always be a point of conflict between a believer and an unbeliever. The level of suffering in that fatal flaw can be dealt with by your behavior. And I'm speaking both to men and to women. You will either in that marriage be the source of pain, or you can make up your mind today, I'm going to be the source of pleasure. People always run from pain and people always run to pleasure. That's usually how most marriages end up where you have a cheating spouse. One person has been subjected to so much pain, they become vulnerable. And then the enemy brings somebody into their life that begins to bring them peace and begins to bring them pleasure. It's not always an upgrade. Men oftentimes have affairs with women who are nowhere near as beautiful in the natural as their wife and vice versa. Women do not always run into the arms of some beautiful, chiseled, actor-type man. Oftentimes when you see the men that are uh, involved in relationships with, with wives that have cheated, they're far below many times the standards, the secular standards of the husband in appearance, in, in education, in wealth, etc., etc. Why? I'll say it one more time. People run from pain and people run to pleasure. And so if you're in a marriage and you have an unsafe spouse, don't miss this. Counseling, I don't care if you go to counseling one hour a night for 50 years. Counseling will never remove the fatal flaw. You know what the answer is? The answer is your spouse being saved. And if you would spend more time fasting and praying for the salvation of your spouse and living in such a way that you peaceably, pleasurably, quietly, honorably keep that marriage healthy to the best of your ability and pray for their salvation, what will salvage that marriage and what will remove the fatal flaw is the day that you get to see your spouse bow before God in humbled prayer and recognize their sin, repent of their sin, and receive Jesus Christ. I never close a broadcast, broadcast without offering you that opportunity, and I'm going to ask you to pray with me as we close. Some of you perhaps are not in right relationship with God, and your life will never be potentially what God's plans are for your life until you have right relationship with God. You need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Some of you will pray with me perhaps for the first time. There's always others that pray who have wandered from God who feel a tug to come back home. And some of you have wandered away and you need to come back home. When we're done praying, I want you to be sure, go to our website, lostlamb.org. It's on the screen. And then click on New Beginnings and listen to the teaching that I've made specifically for you as you get founded in faith and secure faith and grow in faith. Wherever you're at in the world, if you're not 100% sure that your heart is right with God, will you pray with me right now? Just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. I now repent of my sin and I trust in your grace and in your mercy and in the cross where your only begotten son Jesus died. He shed his blood as a payment for all of my sins. 
I trust in Christ. He died, he rose again, he's coming again. I receive him today as my Lord and as my Savior. And I vow this day, strengthen me to walk in the ways of God and to do the will of God is my prayer. I receive salvation today by the grace of God in Jesus' name and I'll never be the same. And let me just take a quick moment to pray for those of you who are listening who are involved in very difficult marriages. Lord, will you allow this teaching from the Word of God as we started, stayed, and finished in the Bible. Let the truth and the precepts of the Bible be like seed and fertile soil. And I pray for the restoration of marriages. But I pray specifically for the salvation of the spouse who is not currently serving you. I pray that by the Holy Spirit there would be a conviction of sin that comes by the Holy Spirit and that you would draw them to yourself. And I pray that all who are listening would have a marriage built upon the foundation of Christ Jesus and that the lamp of God's Word would be the light that leads them throughout every test and challenge and bring peace and pleasure into their home and the joy that comes from sure salvation. In Jesus' name we pray.